um, Hassani Claxton, he is a native from uh, the West Indies. Um, and he, uh, when, did you, when did you come to America? 95, yeah. So um, I can relate to him. Uh, I am the child of the immigrant, uh, immigrant parents, um, Nigerian. And um, stereotype of immigrants is like education first, education first. He played no games with his education. Um, he came over here and he studied business management. He studied law. He was an associate uh, assistant, a, a district attorney um, in the Bronx, of all places. Um, and then he was like, hey, you know what? I also want to do art. Uh, let me just keep at it. <laughs> Putting us all to shame. So um, while he was doing that during the day of being a, a district attorney, he was um, taking art classes at night. Um, that led to an illustration degree. Um, and fast forward, uh, he's been doing his art practice um, and uh, is right now studying for his MFA in painting? In studi studio art, excuse me, in studio art, almost got it, um, at Tufts University, uh, which is amazing, while also being a professor there um, teaching drawing. So um, he has a very, very vast uh, experience um, in, in the education sector. If you want to ask him questions, we have homework. <laughs> ask him any of those subjects, we'll do. Um, so in his work, he, he talks about and he, show, he showcases realism and realism. And he'll talk more about that um, in, in what I mean uh, about merging those two. Um, but that's what our world is about right now, right? There's a lot of things that are going wrong that we dream to be right, and it's like, well, what are the actions that we can take to be right? How can we express in realities of where we live in um, what we're feeling, uh, what we're fantasizing, what we're daydreaming, um, and have them actually be effective and, and change an outcome in the world? Um, so Hassani is going to come up, and he is going to give his amazing, amazing talk um, on his work and his experiences, no pressure, um, on this theme um, as it relates to his life experiences, as it relates to his art practices, and as um, it showcases how strong the correlation between his art practice and life experiences are um, with this theme. Um, afterwards, we'll have a Q&A to continue the conversation. Um, you can tweet us at Baltimore underscore CM if you're social media savvy. Um, and you can tweet us your questions while he's speaking. Something triggers you to want to post a quote, feel free to do that too. Hashtag Baltimore, hashtag Baltimore, or no, CMBAL. Um, but yes, tweet us at Baltimore underscore CM. Um, and then afterwards, you may stay and you may buy more coffee <laughs> and, and great breakfast goods from the room. It's an amazing menu. Um, but yeah, so without further ado, Hassani Cluxton. Good morning. wonderful little black girls. Right now they're nine and six years old. And that's an old picture. They were, they were a little bit younger there. But when I got out of art school, there was a period where obviously when you're an emerging artist or just out of art school, you're not making a whole ton of money. My wife was still a lawyer, albeit she was a civil rights lawyer, so Still not making that much money, but definitely making more money than me. And so it was logical then that I would stay home with the kids for a period of time as a stay-at-home dad. And when you're a stay-at-home dad, your children kind of become your whole world. It's, it's an all-encompassing thing, and you spend so much time with them, all of a sudden you realize that, that you know all the words to the My Little Pony theme song. <laughs> and so, 
you might ask, what does this have to do with fantasy? Well, I'm dealing with fantasy in kind of a broad, expansive view of not just the traditional view of fantasy, but fantasy including superheroes and including uh, science fiction, basically anything that takes the impossible and makes us feel like it's possible. And so this is what we think of when we think of fantasy. It's almost automatic. It's a medieval European setting and is always featuring Caucasian characters. And even someone like me, like I grew up in the Caribbean and I grew up in a place where I, every position of power was held by somebody that looked like me. From my teacher to my doctor, which was my father, uh, to the prime minister who, who uh, just so happened to his son was in my class, a really small island. <laughs> to the chief of police who lived across the street from me. And even me with my kind of Afrocentric background and, and my upbringing, if I pick up a fantasy book and I start reading, if the author doesn't specifically say that the main character is a person of color, I just default to, to them being white. And I've talked to my friends about this who are all like, super Afrocentric, you know, they all woke. <laughs> but we all do the same thing, and it, I, I always thought that was kind of weird, but it, I think that the conditioning goes back to when we're kids. Because our first exposure to fantasy is fairy tales. You know, they're all the same thing, the witches and the wizards and the magic and the talking animals. And when you're younger, fantasy is the genre that, that tends to kind of wrap up your whole uh, thought process about what's possible, and those fairy tales are still medieval European setting with Caucasian characters. If you are a parent, a person of color, trying to raise your child to be well adjusted and to have good self esteem, you're competing with that narrative, and the most ubiquitous and powerful version of it is the Disney princess. And it's everywhere. I know so many parents that try to keep their little daughters from getting obsessed with Little Princess, like, like uh, Disney Princess, and not just people of color, but you know, um, people who just don't want the girls to get caught up in that old kind of patriarchal narrative of, of damsel in distress and that sort of thing. And so um, it's like, you can try to keep it out of your house, but it, it just, it just kind of creeps in there. <laughs> it, it's everywhere. It's like you go, you go to buy diapers and, and they're on the pampers. You go to the bookstore and, and like, there's all the books in there and, and they're all at the little kid's level, so they walk right by them and they look at them. <laughs> and you go into the toy store and the toy store, of course, is very gendered. So you go to the little girl section and the first thing you see is, Princess, blonde hair, blue eyed, Caucasian princess. So in trying to combat this, you know, we tried for a while, and then we finally did what most parents do, and we just sort of gave up. It's like, all right, you know, it already took them. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'm gonna try to see if I can embrace this. This was, this was around the time my eldest daughter was maybe five, my youngest was three. Um, we were trying, you know, we had just had Tiana, and I'm just like, all right, we got a black princess now, we can, we can make this work. <laughs> so my older daughter, who is like hardcore gamer, she pretty much took over my PlayStation now. <laughs> she was just getting into video games back then. Her, her uh, grandfather bought her a Wii. And I bought her this uh, video game, the, the Disney Princess it's, uh, Enchanted Journey. And the reason I bought this game was because it had a feature where you can create your own main character and you can design it to look like you. So you pick the clothes, you pick the outfit, you pick the skin color, you pick the eye color. So you're not stuck playing with a character that's the standard blonde hair, blue eyed, tall, skinny, Caucasian princess which I thought was awesome. And so we got this game home. My daughter was really excited. She's super duper smart, so she figured out how to kind of create her own character. So I, I left her on her own and let her do her thing. 
went in the other room, and then about 10 minutes later, I came back, and I realized that my daughter had created a white character <laughs> with blonde hair and blue eyes. And I went to her, and I said, you know, don't you want your, your character to have, you know, pretty brown skin like you do? And she said, no, Daddy, I want it to be pretty. So, once I got over the shock, <laughs> once I got over feeling like a failure as a parent, and once I kind of like calmed myself down because I was ready to throw that game in the garbage and like every single Barbie doll in the house. But I, you know, I calmed myself down, I did my little woo sa <laughs> And I said, okay, what is it about our society that makes a five-year-old child already internalize the message that white is beautiful and black is ugly? And so I started looking at what were my daughters watching on TV and what were they reading? I noticed one thing. A lot of the shows that they watch have a black character, as in one black character, the token black character who kind of stands in the background, think they're like the best friend. They never kind of have their own story arc or character arc. It's always them existing simply to advance the goals of the main character who is white. And because of that, if there's a character who's not really doing anything, you're not gonna connect with that character. And so I, I would do little experiments. I, I would go with my daughters to Toys R Us and we'd go look at the Disney princess, uh, not the Disney fairies. And we would say, like, I just walk up and there's the one black character, her name is Iridessa. And I would just kind of say, hey, which one of these do you want? And she would always pick Tinkerbell. And, because Iridessa doesn't do anything. Like, if you're a parent, you will have to sit through a lot of, <laughs> a lot of those Disney fairy mo movies. And Iridessa is always just kind of in the background. She doesn't really do anything. So why, you know, why would I want to play with that character? She's boring. And just so you don't think I'm picking on Disney, we tried the same thing with uh, Ever After High. And, and those who don't know, Ever After High is a, it's a series where all the fairy tale characters, their kids are now in high school, and, and it's sort of their travails. <laughs> um, and again, there's one black character, uh, Cedar Wood, she's the daughter of Pinocchio. And we would try the same thing. She wasn't interested in Cedar Wood. She wanted Raven Queen, who is the daughter of the evil queen, who is now good, apparently. <laughs> All right, one more time. We tried with DC Superhero Girls. This one is kind of more recent. And the, the thing that I like about this is like you find that a lot of times the black character is basically a stereotype. When they do get a story arc, it's like, they want to sing, because we know all black people sing. Or they want to play sports, because all black people are good at sports, apparently. And in this one, I loved it because the, the black character, Bumblebee, is a scientist. And she has a few more lines, she's still not really a main character, but she, she's more present. And so the other day, my daughter went out with uh, the grandmother. And my youngest daughter, who's six, she came back with the Mumblebee doll, and I got like all excited, like, oh my god, you got Mumblebee! And they were like, yeah, oh, they were out of Harley Quinn. <laughs> <laughs> and so basically, I kind of gave up on TV because it's kind of, you know, you can't really do anything about what's on TV, but I can definitely control what books come into our household. And so I started doing my research trying to figure out what books can I find by black authors with black protagonists that could maybe uh, help my children see themselves more within this genre of fairy tales. And uh, it was difficult because I'm not sure if you can see the stats from back there. Um, it's children's books are 73.3% white and actually anthropomorphic animals and talking trucks are better represented than people of color in children's books. And it gets worse if you actually have to go to a Barnes and Noble or any other bookstore to try and find these books because I went and I found, I, like, 
I went on the internet and I did my research and I got the, all these books, like authors and stuff. We like, I was like, yeah, all right. So we're, we're on our track, like, like, you know, epic quest to, to <laughs> save my daughter's self-esteem. <laughs> so we went to the, the bookstore and none of those books were there. The only books that were there were, were in the history section of the kids section and it was all about slavery or the civil rights movement. Which is fine, they need to know that stuff, but they need to know that that's not all there is to, to, to our people. They need to have space to, to dream and to see themselves as princesses and knights and all that kind of good stuff. So, I decided, being a creative, that rather than sit there and get mad and complaining, that I would start to create art that caters to what my daughters like. And so throughout my career, it's, it's been a, a theme of mine that, that it's always me on a search to connect with my daughters. And so um, this was the first in a series of African fairies that I started painting. Um, it's actually, it inspired me to start writing a children's book that's about a 12-year-old black fairy from Africa. She's a princess, of course. And uh, she loses a wing when she's uh, attacked by a, a hyena. And she has to overcome her uh, handicap of having one wing, and eventually she uh, saves her kingdom from the trolls. And so I did the fairies for a while. And the thing is with children is, you know, they're into one thing, and then six months later they moved on. And so my youngest daughter, she started getting into knights and ninjas. She watched, she watched the show called Backyardigans, which is kind of this musical thing with these like, weird animals that dance. And there was an episode with <laughs> the brave knights, and then there was another episode with a bunch of ninjas that were trying to steal the shogun's pie. Um, so all of a sudden she's into ninjas and, and basically warriors. So I started incorporating warrior fairies into the fairies that I was doing. And as I was working on the fairies, I started to experience a certain amount of pushback from people who were telling me, I know fairies are part of European mythology, so how can there be black fairies? Well, first of all, you're arguing the natural origin of fictional <laughs> beings. <laughs> and second of all, there actually is, in, in Benin, there is a mythological race called the Aziza that are, that are basically like what we think of fairies. They are, in some versions, they're described as little people with butterfly wings. So these, these things exist all over the place and people seem to think that Africa is a continent with no culture. And that's partly because the image of the African warrior is pretty much this. This is a movie from the 50s talking about the Mau Mau Revolution. And it's actually, um, the Mau Mau was an anti-colonial revolution in Kenya. And um, the Mau Mau are basically depicted as these savage monsters coming after these poor white settlers in, in this movie. And it pretty much goes back to the old colonial narrative which is uh, linked to the philosophy of social Darwinism, that basically all people of color are savages, and that is the responsibility of Europeans to colonize and civilize those savages. And part of the propaganda of that era was to basically portray people of color as having no civilization. So you might say that, you know, that, that Mau Mau movie was in the 50s, But uh, keep in mind that this movie came out four months ago. This is the new Tarzan. So to combat that, I had to do a ton load of research. And I had to make sure that I you know, crossed every T, dotted every I. This is uh, what a medieval knight looked like in northern Nigeria. And you know, I went, I went to a ton of libraries, I went to a ton of museums, and I made sure that everything thing was as accurate as I could possibly get it. Because if I was to do 
a tower the size of the Empire State Building in a medieval European setting, nobody would say, hey, that's not possible. They didn't have the, the capability to do that back then. But if I move that to a city that looks like Timbuktu all of a sudden, oh, wait a minute. Like, Africans couldn't do that. Like, you can accept dragons and you can accept wizards that split their soul into nine horcruxes. <laughs> but you can't accept that Africans had some knowledge of building civil engineering and architecture. So gradually my kids moved on. <laughs> and now they're like really, really into anime which is something that I really love too, so it's one of the things that we bonded over, and it started with Sailor Moon. And um, it kind of put me back at square one because we're right back to the tall, blonde-haired, blue-eyed characters, and which is because it's a Japanese comic, I mean, Japanese cartoon, and it's, we found it was kind of odd. So they moved on from Sailor Moon, and now they're in love with the Glitter Force. <laughs> which is on Netflix. It's, it's basically a ripoff of Sailor Moon. <laughs> but the thing is, you know, I don't, I'm not an animator. I'm a painter and I'm a sculptor. I'm not a comic book artist because I work way too slow. Like, I, I did comic books back in art school, but it would take me like a year to finish a comic book because I, I'm just too slow. It takes me a month to finish a painting. And so, I started thinking about how could I meet my children where they were? How could I use what they love to kind of connect with them and, and kind of spark their creative juices? And th th there's a very specific reason for that because when I was younger, and I, as she said, I'm from the Caribbean. I'm from a little island called St. Kitts. And St. Kitts is 68 square miles. Um, Back then, it was like 36,000 people, and um, there were no artists. I never met my entire life, I never met a professional artist. And it's this sort of attitude in the Caribbean, and, and other people sitting in Nigeria too, that art is not a real job, art is a hobby. So I, it was never within my realm of possibilities, but I knew that I loved to draw. But I never had a, a drawing teacher until I was in high school. Um, Fort Farm, which I guess is the equivalent of like 10th grade. Um, we got a Peace Corps volunteer who had a BFA, and she was teaching art classes at the, at the school. And by then, I was like super into like superheroes, like Batman, Spider-Man, Love Wolverine. And I had all these crazy like badass drawings of all these superheroes in the back of all my exercise books, which instead of taking notes, I was drawing <laughs> superheroes. <laughs> Should have been a sign. But I took all these drawings, I was basically I was looking for a mentor. I was looking for someone to tell me, you can do this. And I went to her and I showed her all my drawings. I was super proud. And she kind of looked down at the side of her eyes and, and she said, and yeah, they're okay, but that's not real art. Now people ask me why I became a lawyer. I think that was a pivotal moment. I was looking for someone to tell me you could do this. And in that moment, I mean, it was like the cartoon where you see the heart kind of pop up and then crack. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't ever want to be that person to my children. She could have pulled out some Roy Lichtenstein and showed it to me, you know, his comic book paintings. She could have pulled out Andy Warhol's Batman and said, look, these are artists who are world-renowned and they're inspired by the exact same thing that you were inspired by. You can do this. And so my goal with my art is to reach my children where they're at and take what they like and apply it so that they can find themselves in it, even if they don't fully understand every aspect of it. So my first attempt at that was, uh, I had been doing paintings of cosplayers and for those who don't know, cosplayers, like if, if you go to like a comic book convention, a cosplayer is somebody who dresses up like a particular character. This is a friend of mine from St. Kitts who is a, who's the local news anchor um, and is the biggest anime nerd you've ever met. And so he cosplayed a character from a, a show called Bleach and I did this picture of him and, and his five cats. 
<laughs> some people, people who love cosplay love it, and my daughter just love the cats because they're super cute. <laughs> and I started thinking about, okay, how can I use this to start to start conversations about issues to get our kids to really think about this stuff. Like my, my daughter is, my eldest daughter is nine and she started to think about these issues and she's starting to have questions. And so I did this painting, if, if, if you ever watch anime, there is, um, every emotion is way over the top. It's like these crazy faces and it's like, somebody drops a pen and all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, my life is over. And it started me thinking about the stereotype of black women as hyper-emotional. And I was trying to think, how can I translate that into an oil painting? And my goal is that it can reach people on many different levels. So on the one hand, you know, my nine-year-old can look at it and say, oh, that's really cool. And then say, what does it mean? Whereas my six-year-old just likes the little cute characters in the corner. And I'm hoping that adults will look at it and take the time to dissect it and think about, you know, yes, it's absurd, yes, it's sort of surreal, but all those stereotypes are just as absurd. Because, like, all, like, particularly the, the angry black woman, like, who are these angry black women? They weren't in my life when I was growing up. Um, you know, there's just so much more to, to black women than that. So I decided I would take these, just to kind of drive the point home, I would take these out of the two-dimensional space and make them as real as possible. And so I created these masks, kind of life-size, of these weird anime faces. And the thing is, if you take something that is cutesy in a cartoon and make it realistic, all of a sudden it just becomes really just unsettling. It's like super duper creepy. And that's my goal, I'm hoping that people that as unsettling as this is, we recognize that these stereotypes are equally unsettling. These are all silicone with uh, Marley hair, which is like what people use for hair extensions. And I had to educate myself about like different kinds of hair extensions and ooh, what you black people, black women go through. <laughs> It was so confusing in the weave shop. <laughs> and so this is part of my new series. It, and it started partly because my daughter, who is now nine, like I said, she's been asking questions about like Black Lives Matter because my wife and I, we, we watch, we, we listen to an obscene amount of NPR. And we watch The Daily Show pretty much every night. And we watch Sam B pretty much every week. And we watch John Oliver pretty much every week. And usually our kids are kind of in the vicinity and we figure that they're not paying attention, but they're listening. Our children are, are listening and watching what we're watching. And so my eldest daughter started asking questions about Black Lives Matter. And she actually asked my wife, uh, you know, Mommy, when I get older, will I be shot by the police? And, and it's like, she's nine years old, she shouldn't have to worry about that. And so this started me doing this series called How Not to Get Your Ass Kicked by the Police. And it's basically, it's kind of like the old goofy cartoons where like the narrator is sort of telling us an instructional thing and Goofy is doing the exact opposite. And so this is the very first one. It's a work in progress. I apologize. It's a little rough around the edges. But it's basically... Uh, <laughs> No dreads, no cornrows, no flat tops, no spiky hair, which is an anime trope. And finally, just no hair. And uh, I'm hoping this can be kind of a conversation starter for people who, who children are just getting to that age where they're asking these questions. And it, it can kind of edge us in that direction of, of getting them to think about these social issues, even though they shouldn't have to at that age, but they have to. It's the world that we live in, especially now. Um, so I'm gonna end with my daughter's drawings. She wants to be an animator. She draws all the time. And she's working on a series of um, black fairy tale characters. And you know, they're not colored in so you can't see that they're black necessarily. But you'll notice, um, 
Little Red Riding Hood with her hoodie that says, I love life, which is awesome, but I'm very proud about that. Her, um, her Jamaican Little Mermaid. I think my mom is Jamaican, I'm pretty sure that's why the Little Mermaid is Jamaican. And she came to me and she was like, Daddy, what's, what's a good like Jamaican name? And I was like, eh, for some reason, a lot of Jamaican girls named Shelly Ann, I'm not sure why. So her Little Mermaid is Shelly Ann Triton. And I was really proud of this one. She managed to, she actually put in a transgender girl, which I can't take credit for that one. My wife is the one that had that conversation. <laughs> and finally, her school project. Uh, one of her black fairy tale characters was a little wolf girl. And uh, the little wolf girl, um, she's asking the question why in every single fairy tale is there only boy wolves? Like, where are the big bad girl wolves? <laughs> so um, it's one of those moments where you just kind of say, you know, I might be pretty damn good at this parenting thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much. Thank you, Olivia, for inviting me.